Today on Lightning Bugs. Share problems, not solutions. I always have a hard time creatively, like in the studio, not micromanaging and not telling someone, giving them hints of how I think it should be solved. You know, that will work. It'll work for a period of time, but it won't actually work to bring out the best in people. You don't actually give the freedom, the flexibility to do that problem solving if you're told what to go do, if you're shared a solution. What you want to do is share problems. So if you're handed a problem, you actually get invested in a finding the right solution and then in making it a success. You seem to allow them a, a playground and don't get up in their face too much. The thing that people really love in life is that creative problem solving endeavor. Like that's, that's sort of our, I think some of our best experiences, especially when we get to do it with other people. Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Hello, this is Ben Folds. It's Thursday. Welcome to my little podcast, Lightning Bugs. Today's guest is Jeff Lawson, CEO and co-founder of Twilio, one of the world's fastest growing technology companies. Jeff is a tinker, always creating and experimenting with software and devices. With his company and work ethic, Jeff has a very unique approach to problem solving, inspiring creativity in this company by looking for the problems instead of selling solutions. Now, you might think, a podcast on creativity, why bring a tech person in? Most of you probably know that's obvious. Technology is very creative, and creativity is often about problem solving. So Jeff gives us a little different insight into the world of creativity and also how to work with other people who are creative. He's overseeing this whole group, a whole team of software uh, developers, and he considers them artists. Let's see what Jeff is working on. This is cool because the times that, that we've talked before uh, has been very me-centered, and, uh, and, and you've been such a gracious uh, interviewer and host, and, uh, you know, so rudely, I... I I di didn't do enough of my research as to what you did. To me, you're you're the cool dude that came backstage with your family once, and we talked uh, on the internet. So um, I started stalking you so, because I felt like we were talking about stuff that um, I don't know. You knew something, and turns out you do. So this is really fun. So I I. I, I went all over the internet looking for it. Your company is, Twilio is conspicuously unfamous in, for the, for the punter and the layman, considering the incredible success it's had. Do you kind of, do you kind of dig, dig that angle of it? I mean, I did get your app, and I don't know what it does yet. An app, and I don't know what it does yet. Maybe you can tell me what this does at some point. It's called Authy. Oh, Authy, yeah. yeah. Authy, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. Like that's the only actually consumer app that we have. And uh, what Authy does is, you know, a lot of companies use us to secure your login, right? So, like, if you log into Netflix. They'll send you a text message with like a six-digit code you have to enter to say, to prove that you are who you say you are, so to provide another layer of security for your account. And what Authy does is it kind of does that just without the text message. It enables you to get a, a, a secure code. But if you're somewhere where you know you can't get a text message, like you're on an airplane, or yeah, you, know, you just want the immediacy of it, you don't want to wait for the text message. Authy provides another solution for that. And um, so it's really good. I mean, you got to have two-factor auth for like all of your online accounts nowadays because. You know all those password breaches that occur in the world, where some company's you know password database gets exposed, and you know you reused your password on five sites. It's like oh, by no fault of your own, all of your accounts are now at risk. Um, and so you know you got to add that. The reason I wanted you on here is because what you do has to consider all angles of creativity. That what you do is is not only creative, but it really has to jump into the management of creativity. And the personal relationships that happen in collaborations, and um, so I just want to let you explain for a moment that because creativity gets, you know, gets put in the corner of the arts, 
And as you and I talked about before, creativity is part of life and, in fact, is part of survival and certainly part of any success. So I'm going to hand it over to you so that you can explain to dummies like me what you do and any of the history of it so that we can take it on board. I'll go back to the beginning a little bit. So I'm a software developer. I started writing code um, in college uh, in the mid '90s when I was, you know, of that age. And the interesting thing about that period of time was the internet was this brand new thing. Like it was, it's just coming out. You know, you just started having these online experiences. And the interesting thing about it, like I had an Apple IIe computer. Did you have one of those? No, I didn't get into the whole computer thing until somewhere in the 2000s. So. So, so I had one of these old, you know, Apple computers back in the '80s when I was a little kid, and you know, you could build these little dinky programs on it. You know, you could do the like, you know, you know, ten print hello Ben, twenty go to ten, and make the computer just say hello Ben for you know infinity. And you could build these dinky little things, but you couldn't really do anything meaningful. And it wasn't until the internet came along when, as a software developer, you could like build something, put it out on the internet. And you could have millions at that time, and today billions of people actually be able to use the thing that you built. And you think about how easy it is to discover anything using Google or with mobile apps. You can go to an app store and download an app. So if you're a software developer, you have the ability to like, you know, write some magical codes <laughs> to build some sort of app, upload it to the internet, to the app store, or put it online at a website. And suddenly, if you built something that's interesting, billions of people can use it overnight. And Humanity has not really had that scale of creation before. And so a lot of people think about the impact that computers have had on creative fields like music or film, you know, as a musician, right? You, like you don't even need to get signed anymore. Like you can record something in your apartment. You can mix it with Pro Tools, right? Right on your home computer. You can put it on SoundCloud. And if it's good, you know, it can get you can it can become popular. The same thing has happened with with like film and video, right? You can you don't need to have a studio anymore, and you don't need to have a you know, million dollar production budget. You can go shoot something with a digital SLR. You can edit it on um, Final Cut Pro, which by the way is the same thing that they use to cut major motion pictures. You can buy it for three hundred bucks on your Mac, and then put it on YouTube. And there's stuff on YouTube that's got billions of views, right? And so the same creative transformation has really happened to software developers and entrepreneurs, where if you have an idea for a way to serve a customer, to build something online that customers will want, well, you can go build it, put it online, buy some Google AdWords, or put it in the App Store, and billions of people can become your customers. And so this has opened up software as a huge creative field, unlike, unlike it has ever been in the past. Well, because you're making creative tools, which were always, I mean, the, the, the piano, that's one someone you know worked out for me years ago and now I get to write things on the piano imagine all all the all the music that would have never been written without the creativity of building the piano I kind of feel like what you're saying in a way is that you, one of the things you have done in your life is essentially build creative instruments exactly but for software developers and so now I'll get to what Tulio does after giving that background right so um, as developers are going out and building all these interesting you know, mobile apps we use every day and, and web applications that we're using all the time, they need those apps to do certain things. And you know, obviously, there's like they need a server to host it on, and they have to store files and data. But one of the things that software developers often need to do is actually communicate with you, their user. And so if a developer wants their app to send you a text message when, you know, your order ships or let you text them to ask them a question or have a video session um, with, with somebody for like learning or distance learning or telemedicine or um, uh, send an email to you, something as simple as that, Twilio enables developers to just with a few lines of code really quickly and easily plug that capability into the app they're building. And apps nowadays, like an app that you might use on your on your phone, is a collection of a lot of these different services that enable the developer to snap these things together really quickly so that they can build something meaningful and launch it and serve a global customer base pretty easily. And so what Twilio does is the communications part of that whole story. You saw there was a need for some of these things to be connected, is what I'm hearing. Like is the 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 someone like Uber. Like you've you've worked with 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 Uber before. Still remember, I just play piano. 
what did you do for what did you do for Uber and and how does that affect me in my day as I need to get a ride somewhere? Absolutely, right? So Uber is one of our customers they have been a customer for a long time. The problem that they were solving it was first thing actually in the very early days of Uber, we started working with them in 2011 I think. They just needed to text you to tell you when your ride was arriving. You know, because if you were inside your house or your work and your car was arriving, they needed to send you that notification. So the first thing they did with us was to say, hey, Ben, your, your ride is arriving. Here's the license. You know, your, your, your black Honda Accord is arriving. Your, your driver is Julie and go outside now because they're arriving. Great. Very simple. I'll like, well, take that for granted. I'm like, of course it works that way. Well, guess what? <laughs> they had to go build that. Right. Well, because otherwise, Julie, Julie might start texting me uh, uh, two or three weeks later, and I don't want to talk to Julie. Well, that's the next thing they built. Yeah, because they in the very early versions of Uber, they would actually just give your phone number to the driver and the driver's phone number, their personal phone number to each other and say, hey, if you need to contact each other because you can't find each other, here's their phone number. You know, this is a big privacy problem. And people were rightfully saying, whoa, 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 I don't, I'm not sure I want that person to have my personal phone number. And so they brought Twilio in so that when you called the other person because you needed to know where they were, I can't find you or whatever, um, you weren't actually calling their personal phone. They used Twilio to create what's called a proxied communication. So you'd call a phone number and they knew which phone number like was associated with the ride and they could forward the call to Julie and she'd answer the phone and like, you know, a, an hour or two after the ride, assuming that everything went well, you didn't leave something in the car or whatever, they could just break that connection. So if you called that phone number back and they would say, sorry, you know, this phone number is no longer associated with, with a ride. Um, you know, you can't, if you need help, here's our contact center, right? Why couldn't Uber just do that themselves? Because you need to actually connect with all the telcos of the world and you need to be able to get phone numbers all around the world. Um, and you need to be able to then do these real-time communications, which is not something most software developers know how to do. So, you know, myself, I had started three companies before Twilio. And, you know, one of them was, uh, for example, StubHub, the online ticketing company. If you've ever bought or sold your tickets or been angry that people bought tickets to your shows on StubHub. No, never. I used to get basketball tickets that way all the time for my kids. It's great. I know. It's fantastic. And, you know, like when we were building StubHub, we had a similar problem, actually. This was in 2000. Because um, we said, oh, you know, if you bought a ticket, you know, in the, like the last few hours before the event, you'd have to go pick it up from like, you know, someone would actually be delivering the ticket to the street corner outside the venue so you can pick it up and go in. And we said, how do we coordinate the communication? And we actually had the idea. We said, oh, it would be great if like, you could just call and, and create a connection to that person who's selling it. But we were like, I don't know how to do that. Making a phone ring is like magical. Like I, I know how to write a web page you know, as a developer. Like that's something I know how to do. But making a phone ring, like that's magic. I have no idea how that works. And after having that experience multiple times in a row throughout my career, sometimes it was we needed a phone call. Sometimes we needed a text message. Sometimes we needed something else. It's like, why is this impossible for a developer to figure out? Let's go make it possible and put this capability like kind of into the tool belt of the developers. One of my uh, um, favorite producers I ever worked with, Elliot Shiner, and he's done, he's a legendary engineer. I think one of his first gigs was, uh, was on um, Van Morrison Moondance. Moondance. Yeah. Classic. And he said what he laments what he misses in the music business or in, in recording is that every album used to be problem solving. And, uh, and it's something that I thought about in our last conversation because so much of your world seems to be just that. If someone throws you a problem, that has to be solved. There is inherent creativity in that. And um, I don't think people think about that. What we think about is the romantic side of creativity, but really you have to understand how you're going to solve a musical problem the same way as you would have to figure out how to solve a software problem. If you can't solve that problem, then you don't get to communicate your idea and share it with others. Um, when you're solving a problem now, you're in a position, I mean, I assume you're not doing code. I don't even know what hacking code means, but I'll just say you're not doing that now, like you're managing sympathetically other people who are doing this, right? That's right. So, so I'm, I started the company with, with two friends. I'm the CEO. And Twilio now has close to 5,000 employees around the world. And so I don't get a chance to, I don't, like, I don't write code for Twilio anymore. I, I let the professionals do that now. Um, although I do on the side still do it because I just get tremendous joy from creating things. 
But now my, the way I conceptualize my job is to create the environment where those 5,000 people can actually be creative problem solvers. And every day figure out, you know, hey, what are the problems that our customers need us to solve and be able to say like, yes, I can do that. And the sad thing is that most companies, as they get bigger, it actually gets harder and harder for people to actually focus on solving problems because the sort of gravity, the weight of the organization starts to get in the way. And so as a leader of a company, you know, I always think that my job is to try to figure out how do I build a company where everybody can wake up every day and feel like, you know, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go solve problems for customers, whether it's writing code, if you're an engineer, or if you're a salesperson, how do you go serve a customer, customer support, you know, there's all of these people inside the company. But how do you create an environment where like the weight of the company isn't the thing that is like um, what is driving everybody, but rather is that outward facing customer problem solving bit? Because when you do that successfully, A, Obviously, you're going to serve your customers better. You're going to create better products, better experiences. You're going to have more business success. But the other thing is, like, the best employees are going to want to work there and want to do their best work because, look, most people are like every function that I've ever met, every like person who does something at Twilio, whether you're writing software, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a lawyer, the thing that people really love in life is that creative problem solving endeavor. Like, that's that's sort of, our, I think, some of our best experiences, especially when we get to do it with other people. I always have a hard time uh, uh, creatively, like in the studio, not micromanaging and not telling someone, giving them hints of how I think it should be solved. And we kind of talked about this a little bit before. I, I have a feeling that some of your success might have to do with how good of a, a music producer you are and that you allow them, you seem to allow them a, a playground and don't get up in their face too much. You know, it's really hard because we all want to get into problem solving mode and we all have ideas for how we think it should be done. And so what I found is the best way to, to try to get the most out of other people is to share problems, not solutions. And so what that means is, let's say there's something we're trying to accomplish as a company. You know, like I can think through, oh, like here's this thing and I can figure out how I'd want it, how I'd want it solved and here's how I'd do it. And I can write down kind of like a, I can write it all down. I put the answer in place and give it to a team and say, hey, go do this thing. And, you know, that will work. It'll work for a period of time and it'll work if I happen to be right. Um, but it won't actually work to bring out the best in people especially when that work is creative. You know, you think about the military, it's like a command and control kind of environment where it's like, you know, do what I say, you don't ask questions, like that's command and control. And for things that aren't creative, if it's, you know, just like, you know, you got, I don't know what they, what they, what they do. You, you join the army. No, <laughs> I thought about it. I never, like, I don't know what they do in the military, but like the, the classic idea is like you have the chain of command and people follow orders. And in creative fields, that actually rarely works out um, because what you you don't actually give the freedom, the flexibility to do that problem solving if you're told what to go do. If you're shared a solution, then you just are basically like, go do this thing. You're like a, a factory worker in an assembly line. Go put, put this thing on. But for creative work and for really like intellectual work, what you want to do is share problems. And so you take the idea of... Um, what it is you want to accomplish. And instead of trying to think about like, here's the solution I want people to go build, say, here's the problem I want them to go solve. And when you do that, it really changes the nature of how they do the work because now they own that problem. And a certain amount of pride and intrinsic motivation to really come up with better solutions and then to own the solution. Like, you know, how many times if you hand someone like, go do this, they'd be like, well, you know, that seems pretty stupid to me, but I was told to go do it. So I guess I'm going to do it. As opposed to if you're handed a problem, you actually get invested in a finding the right solution and then in making it a success. Hi, Ben. This is Carol Pillow. Hey, Carol Pillow. And my question is for future generations, when you are past, would you rather be remembered as an arts advocate, first and foremost, or do you want just your music? to be remembered mm. by and thank you very much thank you carol pillow honestly i don't think i can 
even answer that. I th- I think that I have, like people do, tried to kind of accept and understand that nothing of what I have done will last. And it won't last forever. I've tried to embrace that that's not why you make something. I'm coming around to a place where what I'm most concerned with is making, creating, the process of that, and just doing the best I can, and doing one and then moving on and doing the next thing. Short-sightedness. The reason is, is because, you know, nothing, nothing's going to last. And I think that's an important thing for me, uh, maybe not all artists, but to get their head around because you can't control how people take something. The other thing is that Yes, I would like to be thought of as a music advocate mainly because I would like to think that it did have a positive effect on people's lives. If they didn't know why they got a little more education or why their parents uh, uh, insisted that they learn to sing a little younger or something that I might uh, uh, have an influence on, I really would like to think that I don't care if my name's attached to that at all. Um, I should enjoy imagining that that would happen, and I should enjoy the process of making it happen. And all the people that I meet, as soon as I, as soon as I became more and more vocal about, say, music therapy, uh, music therapy, and advocating for the arts, I mean, it's not fair. I was suddenly got more than I'll ever give. I can try to give all I want to, but I just keep getting like I. Uh, I, I, I get to meet people and be inspired by their perspective. I get to see a side of life that I normally wouldn't see. I get to see it having an effect sometimes and see the other side of things. And that, to me, is embarrassingly rich, enriching. And I just go, am I given enough to, to, to deserve the joy of seeing that? Um, and that, to me, is, is when I'm in the healthiest state of mind. When I'm in a less healthy state of mind— I worry that my song would last as long as someone else's song. Or I worry that, oh, I'm just going to be known as an advocate. I'm going to be known as a rock star. Or I'm going to be known only for that song and I want to be known for another. So it comes back to it. It's very long-winded. But I think these things are long-winded concepts. If someone is not being extremely generous when they make something, if they're not, if they're not making something that is... Uh, useful and enjoyable for them to make, then it comes off flat, which is at odds with the idea that you're only making it for yourself. A lot of people jump straight to like solutions and like, oh, I have an idea, right? Like that's a classic thing in, in business, especially in like the world of software or technology. It's like, oh, I have an idea. My idea is so good. That's a solution. But gold in terms of like business isn't great solutions. It's actually great problems to solve. Where should you go look for the next big opportunity isn't a solution. That's a a question of which problem should I go solve. And so building an environment where you seek problems that need solved, big unsolved problems, I actually think that's the goal of many leaders. So for like to translate that to other creative fields, like what area is ripe for, like, no one's done this before. No one's written an album like this. No one has actually had a piano-fronted rock band trio. Hey, let's go do that, right? That's how you're going to differentiate. That's how you're going to make a name for yourself. And the same thing goes in film or other creative fields. It's like, what's the thing that hasn't been done yet? That's what drives us. That's what motivates us. Well, that's what kind of I found a business is all about. That's what is so exciting is when you actually find that area, wait, like, hey, no one solved this yet. That's what actually gets you out of bed in the morning. And so it's that seeking of problems that I think motivates the best people because then you've got something juicy to go chew on. Whereas just doing the same thing that everyone else has done, doing it yet again, you know, it's less interesting. And as a creative person, you want to drive yourself, you want to differentiate, you want people to appreciate what you've done. The best way to do that is to essentially like solve a new problem. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that probably describes how I got into the music business because there was already a problem that existed for a piano player that wanted to play rock clubs. Rock clubs didn't have pianos on the stage and it wasn't cool. And, and I just, I knew that if I could figure out how to get a piano onto the stage night after night, that there would be no competition. 
I could suck and, and, uh, and do just fine. And, um, and that's really what we did. I mean, every day was about, okay, well, the ramp has to be longer than the piano. And then the ramp has to be, has to, has to, has to go behind a truck that's the same size. So when we park in front of rock clubs in, in the middle of downtown, we need three lengths of, of van in order to get the piano out without damaging the car that's behind it. And there weren't cell phones then. So we would have to get there two or three hours ahead of time and go chasing everyone down whose car might be there and wait to get the, the, uh, uh, get that out. Then someone was going to have to wait to make sure we could get it back on, uh, in the middle of, you know, the middle of the night, cause we were usually opening up for somebody. So while like some band called something like fucking death grip was playing their set, <laughs> we were winding the piano through the crowd and, and up. And that whole problem solving thing was, I didn't even think about writing songs. I wrote songs as an afterthought. I, my, my main, my main consideration was just the fun of solving the problem of getting the piano off and on stage. And I bet it was like sort of a pain in the ass, but also something that you found really interesting and like motivated you to figure it out better every day. Totally. Yeah. And uh, it's, I just, you know, I, I'm fascinated to see that it works the same way. I mean, what people need right now and what they're interested in is way more in, uh, in your category. This is the era of technology uh, and digital technology. I think about when you look back at uh, the greatest, the pinnacle of any art form, they're always working just beyond their actual ability on the shoulders of giants and everyone's putting everything into it. The reason that analog tape sounded great in the 80s was that it was making so much money and so many people were working so hard to make sure that everyone that had tape needed tape. It takes two or three weeks just to run the first quality control batch. So right now, if we want to make, if we want to make analog tape, you know, you fire the machines up and do it, but there's no quality control. So if you look at the photography of the 40s and 50s, when they were on a certain thing, it's never been surpassed for what it was. It's just the process and everything was so intense. Now I feel like the thing that 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 will be unsurpassable in the future is probably what you're doing. The problems that you're solving, the things that you're doing, and uh, the way that you're connecting uh, apps and softwares and company and people and SMSs and all this kind of stuff strikes me as something that people will look back at in 50 years and go, remember the old days when people used to do it this way? How the hell did they pull that off? <laughs> well, I mean, this is, there is a certain, you know, golden era of reinvention that's going on right now. I mean, you think about how iPhones have impacted our lives and just how much our lives have changed in the last 10 years because of the computer in our pockets always connected to the internet. Um, that's just opened the door for so many new ideas. You know, some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them are net positives for society. Some of them are actually probably in the fullness of time. We're going to say we're horrible for society, but it unlocked so much new, um, new ideas and new innovation. And I, I always think that, you know, one of the key things that drives innovation is just the reduction of barriers. And the more you can reduce barriers to people exercising that creative gene, taking that idea and taking it from an idea in someone's head to actually making it happen, the cheaper, the faster, the easier you can make that, the more innovation, the more creativity you're going to have. And this is like sort of interesting, you know, when, when, you know, Twilio, uh, you know, probably one of our, our, our biggest product is, is Twilio SMS messaging. And, you know, we did not invent SMS, obviously it's been around for 30 years. And even when we started this product around 2010, you know, if you wanted to send a text, if you were a company wanted to send a text message, like you probably remember back then, every once in a while, you'd have something where like, oh yeah, the, the airline sent me a text message. It was kind of neat, but I don't know how to, like, that was kind of weird. Um, you could do it. And it cost thousands of dollars. You paid up front, like tens of thousands of dollars, actually. And it took you like six months to, you could do it, but it was hard and it was expensive. And what Twilio did is we took it from you know months and tens of thousands of dollars to minutes and one dollar for what it took for a developer to get started if they wanted to do that. And what you saw then was, oh, so because it was so fast, cheap, and easy, 
you got so many people trying out new ideas. And experimentation is the prerequisite to innovation. The more experiments you can run, the more things you can try, the faster you're going to ferret out the good ones from the bad ones. Well, and, and it turns out that that process of uh, being able to do experiments, to try things, to see what sticks against the wall, that's essentially the process of creation. That's the core of that creative process. If you think about like how hard it is to create something is inversely proportional to how much is going to get created. Well, and it also yields more failure. Yes. Right. And therefore, more tolerance of failure is needed. You know, I always think there was a great biography written of the Wright brothers um, several I years ago. I think I read that. Did you read that one? Did you read about how they, they went out, you know, bicycle mechanics in Ohio had the idea, like, we can create the flying machine, right? And they built, they took all these measurements in their lab of, like, what they thought, how, how they thought it would work, and they built the first version of the machine. They packaged it all up in, in crates, and they, they sent it out on, on rail cars to Kitty Hawk. They went out there in the summer, and this was miserable. This was like a, a beach where, you know, there were biting flies, and, and it was like there were no facilities at all. It was pretty miserable, even for the time. And they put together their flying machine, and then one of them would, like, get in it. And then be like, what do we do now? Like, I don't know, launch it. And they'd launch it, and the thing would crash, right, spectacularly. Yeah. And it would break, and they would be bruised, and and what they, they would just fix it up again. They'd bandage themselves, and they do, and they'd do it all summer until either they – or the machine was too broken to go on, they pack it all up and they go home. And they take all the measurements that they made and they take all, you know, all everything they learned and they build the next version of the flying machine. And next summer, go back out and do it again. And they did this for like five, six years in a row. And until finally they had the one that flew. And the amazing thing about this story is like, can you imagine what it must have been like getting into this contraption, knowing that every time you tried it, you might very well die. In fact, they did have multiple near-death experiences, but yet believed that that experimentation was worth it. And I, like, I just look back on that and other stories of that era of what it took to experimentally figure out the next thing. And now I think about, in some ways, how easy we have it. You know, like I'm a software entrepreneur, like I, you know, write some magical codes into a text editor and put it on the internet. And if it works and like people like it, it's like, boom, you're off to the races. If they don't like it, oh, well, you know, tomorrow night I'll write some different code. And you don't have to wear a helmet when you do your job. Yeah. You like substantially fewer trips to the hospital in trying to innovate in software or I imagine music, although maybe not rock music. Is there a personality type to, uh, uh, to, um, developers? Well, you know what's funny? A lot of develop there's a big overlap between people who like to write code and the kind of brain that is drawn to that and music, actually. I know so many developers who on the side are musicians. Um, you know, I wrote a book uh, that came out early this year called Ask Your Developer. And it's really about helping like helping business people to understand developers in order to bring out the best in them in order to win because this digital world that we're in like every company needs to become really good at building these software experiences and so they rely on developers yet to, to a lot of especially business executives and a lot of people in the world it's like developers are like they're the other it's like you know they're like steve urkel you know or like my favorite dennis nedry from uh jurassic park remember the guys rolling around in the mud dinosaurs about to eat him is like that's the picture of this developer it's like this math geek who's more comfortable with a quadratic equation than they are with like another human being and that's the stereotype it's like in reality software developers are creative creative people and so like i talk about one of my you know one of the developers i talked about in the book is this guy named um chad chad etzel and his like handle on twitter is jazzy chad and his picture forever has been him playing a saxophone and he's like a pretty awesome saxophone player and an amazing developer. And by the way, not just like a math geek, but he loves building apps. He likes, hey, I think there's a customer problem I can go solve. Like, I'm going to go build it like end to end, not just like, hey, you know, tell me what code to write so I can, you know, give me some Mountain Dew and I'll, and I'll you know, write your code for you. It's like, no, I want to build an app that solves a customer problem. And I find that so many uh, software developers are actually like that, where they, they see software as this tool. It's their instrument, like you said. And with it, they can bring people joy. They can solve problems. And, and by the way, they can build interesting businesses too. And so there's so much overlap between the world of, of creative, uh, the creative world of music and, and the other creative endeavors like software. I think people are really caught up as creative creatures 
on the success story so much that they're ashamed and fearful of trying stuff that doesn't work. Well, I noticed in your bio, uh, one of the things or one of your bios online that was entertaining to me was that in 2008, when you started Twilio, one of the things you did was launch an app to Rickroll people. Is that true? (laughs) That is actually true, yes. (laughs) Would you consider that one of your great successes? (laughs) Well, it helped the company get off the ground. So, yeah. so you know, the, the first product that we built was Twilio Voice. It allowed you to write some code that would initiate a phone call. And then you could describe with code, like, what happened during the phone call. So not just, like, make the phone ring, but when they answered, like, oh, you could play back some audio. You could read back, uh, you know, some text with a computer voice. You could uh, connect two calls together to create a conversation. You could do all these things. And so one of the things in, in the early days of Twilio, we built a lot of stuff on Twilio just to test it out, just to, to you know, use our own product to figure out if we liked it or not or what we would change about it. And I don't know where the idea came from. I, it was like, it was right around the time when the Rickroll became a thing, right? It was like, I think it was April Fool's of 2008 when YouTube changed all of the videos to the, to the Rick Astley song. And so... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I got this idea, but I just had this this thing where I, you would send an email to like a certain email address with a phone number, and then Twilio would initiate a phone call, and when you answered it, it would just play the song. That was it, and it was like five lines of code. I written it for a, just for like a total joke, just to see if it would work, and and then I shared it with a few people, <laughs> and, and they would always. Ask, how do you, so how do you do that? I was like, oh, well, you just email. And then boom, they started doing it to other people. And lo and behold, the day before we actually launched the company, one of our investors rickrolled a reporter, uh, one of the tech reporters. Oh, with, oh fantastic. Um, and the tech reporter was like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's Twilio. And he wrote the story. There's actually a story written about us. Like, apparently there's a new company that their product is rickrolling. And I'm like, no, that's not what we do. <laughs> but, you know, who, who can give up a good hook like that? That the actually the following day when we did actually launch, we were able to say, here's what we're actually doing. Um, it gave them a hook for like why they might care. And it turns out like, you know, that's a pretty sticky story to like be able to say like, hey, remember this Rickroll app? It's actually just, you know, a byproduct of this brand new company that's launching. So it did help us put us on the map in the very early days because look, whether you're a musician, a software developer, an entrepreneur, whatever you are, your biggest enemy is obscurity. And making anyone in the world give a shit about what you do and your idea, your creation, whatever it is, like that's the hardest thing in the world. Each week's guest does what I call a new week's resolution, which is essentially just an exercise that we're all going to do that will help our creativity. Because you're you're a creator that has been successful in, in your creations. And I think we could all uh, use a Jeff Lawson exercise. So if it's not asking too much, uh, what would you have our exercise for the week be? Here's what I would say, you know, going back to a lot of our conversation already about the global audience that is the internet. Create something that you're not proud of, put it out there anyway. And don't worry that it's not perfect. And just ask for feedback. And if you do that every week, I think you'd get better and better at your creative endeavor. If you didn't have fear of being wrong or fear of being judged, but you just said, I'm going to try it and I'm going to put it out there in the world and ask for feedback, that is something that um, the internet is really good at. Whether it's friends, family, or fans, you want them to put it up publicly or just publicly? Yep. Publicly. So that could be on, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, however it is that you broadcast to your friends and people out there. Yeah. Like hashtag no fear, <laughs> no, no fear of failure. Um, I'm just going to put an early work out there. Okay. And I want y'all to tell me if I'm on the, if I'm on the right path. Okay. So they've got a week variety. Does it have to be something that you think is bad or just the next thing that you think of? Well, I wouldn't try to create something that's bad in order to fulfill on the assignment. But what I would do is say, we all have fear, right? I've been, I'll, I'll show you a little project I've been working on for the last month or so. I've been, this is, I invented this. It's called the Zoom Cube. 
because we're all in Zoom meetings all day, every day, right? Yeah. It is a box where this button mutes the, this, this mutes, this one starts and stops the video and this one ends the meeting. So it's got the little safety toggle switch. So it end, ends, ends the meeting. And um, so I call it the Zoom Cube and I've been making these. I actually, I've got, I've made about 20 of them. I'm soldering the circuit board and I wrote all the software for it. And I've been delaying actually posting anything about this. So I'm like, oh, I got, there's another thing I got to do. There's another, another change I got to make. There's, but I kind of want to tell the world about it because I think it's just kind of a fun little thing. But I keep delaying. Oh, there's one more thing I need to do before I can tell the world right. about it. So you've just practiced what you preached. Well, I haven't done it yet. But what I'm, the advice I'm giving myself right now is like, screw it. I should just tell the world about this thing and see what people say. People like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Or it looks like, it looks like one of the guys from Devo. Um, or, uh, wow, that's really cool. Can I get one? You know, like, so... You know, that's just a, a thing. If I put it out there, it'll just tickle. And maybe it'll inspire other people. In fact, I got inspired because somebody I saw a post back in December with some guy was like, I want a pull chain to end my Zoom meetings. And so he posted that he built a thing. He built a little pull chain. And it's like, goodbye. And it ends the meeting. And I took that idea. And I obviously added the end meeting thing. And I made mine a toggle switch. But then I said, you know what I really need to do, actually, is I'm always muting and unmuting. I want a big old big honking button to hit to mute and unmute instead of trying to find the right key on the keyboard. Um, I think yours is a little more ergonomic. You've improved on it because you would have to like get the chain. You'd have to dangle the chain from the ceiling and that would be hardwired through stuff. The, but the fact that that guy built the chain pull device, that Led got me you. inspired. And I said, oh, you know what? That's really cool. And I actually took, he open sourced the designs. And so I actually took some of the designs as a starting point, discovered a few new th tricks and things. And then I built upon it. And so the more we're willing to put out there, A, the more feedback we're going to get of like, hey, that's awesome. Good job. Or like, oh, have you thought about this or that? Uh, so the faster we get over the fear of being judged of like, well, what will people say? What, what the code that I wrote is like not, you know, it's not elegant enough. I need to make it look better because I, the other software developers will be like, wait, Jeff, what a bad software developer he is. You wrote it that way? I'm like, screw it. I'll just put it out there and, and, and not worry about that stuff. But I may also inspire other people to then do something of their own. That's important. So I'm going to modify just to say, because I'm thinking, I'm trying to think like a teacher, like something that, that will actually be achieved because I want people to do it. Why don't we say that whatever the last idea you had was that you didn't show to anybody? That way it's already there. They don't feel like they have to cook up something out of nowhere. The last idea that you had that you were like, no, I'm not letting anyone see this. Put it out this week. You have to. Put it out. Put it out there. I like that. That's a great exercise. I do have a card that says realizing an idea and have a pointer from idea to realizing latency uh, in, in, in your business is, is, uh, is, is that latency shortening? Absolutely. That pace has accelerated, but also it, it, it doesn't just accelerate the pace for the sake of acceleration. It also accelerates your ability to test whether or not the world wants the thing that you, the idea that's in your head. Because people get married to their own ideas, right? You think, oh, I, I have this idea. It's the best idea in the world. Like your friend Jack, right? Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. And what's interesting, if you remember the dot-com era, you know, around 2000, the, the thing back then was everything was pretty slow and expensive. So if you had some idea for a new company, like you remember Webvan, like the very famous, you know, let's deliver groceries. It turns out actually is a good idea, just way ahead of its time. But they had to raise, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from investors and go build out data centers and buy all the vans and all this kind of stuff. And by the time they did all that, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they found out actually customers weren't ready for them. Or pets.com, right? The delivering dog food, I, you know, right? Another classic one where... The world just wasn't ready for it yet, but they had to spend years and hundreds of millions of dollars to answer that question. And now, with the state of software and other creative fields as well, you can test out these ideas really cheaply, quickly, and inexpensively. And that, that latency, that reduction of latency, means, again, that like just more things are going to get tried. And there's going to be more failures, more, you find out. But like when you're a developer and you spend, I don't know, a day writing a thing and you, it's like a prototype and you put it out in front of some customers and say, do you like this? And they say, nope, it sucks. Like, what'd you lose? You lost a day. You know, maybe you spent uh, $5 on some of the infrastructure like servers or Twilio or whatever. 
you're like, oh, well, back to the drawing board, new idea. But when you spent years and hundreds of millions of dollars, it's a much bigger deal to have that kind of failure. I guess arguably in a way for a musician, sometimes I, I, I worry that, uh, that, 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 maybe some things about latency were better for my creative process, even just rewinding tape. We don't rewind tape anymore. So the engineers already, as soon as you screw up, it's like, it's okay. Gotcha. And they press play. And I'm not really, I'm not ready for that. Also, if, 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 if I don't have to concentrate and practice and worry and worry and, and get it right in my head, um, sometimes it's, it doesn't have time to, to develop, you know, if I'm going to, if I have an idea and it's going to take me three days to realize that idea and an investment of my time and energy, I am more invested and more prepared for that idea. If someone says, well, you can have 70, 80 ideas, just keep having them over and over again. And I don't have that time to do it. That does kind of worry me as an artist a little bit. It's interesting, you know. You can ha- you can have that sort of intent, like the the stakes are lower. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But the flip side is, you know, think about the, yeah, you know, think about that Eminem song, right? You know, like you got one shot. This is your only shot, right? And, uh, and it's like you succeed or fail. Like the number of people in that position who are going to succeed is going to be pretty low. Like if you truly believe, I only have one shot. We rented the studio, cost a fortune. We've got three days. We got to get it right. How many times did that actually not res- result in success? And therefore, people had to be like, well, I guess I'm not doing that again because I borrowed you know, 20 grand from my uncle and you know, now I'm screwed, right? As opposed to the people for whom, instead of having one shot, they got 100 shots to get it right. And maybe the first one, the pressure was lower, so they didn't get it right. Maybe, maybe they would have in the other world. But now in the world, if they didn't get the first shot right, they've got try number two, three, four, five, 10, 100 until finally they do get it right. And I tend to think that the more at bats, like to use a baseball analogy, the more at bats you get, the more likely you are to hit a home run. And so really some of this stuff like, oh, I don't have to wait for the tape anymore. Well, that means that you don't have to worry about the studio time anymore. But you also don't have the consumables, like, oh, like we ran out of tape or like whatever it is. Like we, you know, we we can't do anymore because we're out of the like now that it's all digital, it's like, well, you never run out of tape. You never run out of uh, of these things. And so it's like, you do get the opportunity. You know, we were talking about photography earlier and there was an idea that like, Oh, when you had a role, like, remember you could buy the roles of 24 or 36 or 12, if you were really budget constrained. Um, I don't know why they were all multiples of 12. I don't know. It's probably because of the reason that you know, like 35 millimeters times 12 was like the, the unit that they could cut them into or something. Um, and you would have to have to think about every shot because you you would spend, you know, it was like a buck for the film and like two more bucks to go develop it. And you had to get it right. And like there was a certain beauty to that of having to plan out the shot, of actually having to care. When you pulled the shutter, you actually had to care that like, yeah, this is worth it. Whereas now, you know, I've got a digital SLR that I sometimes use for photography. And it's like you press the shutter, you just took like a hundred shots. Like it's like a rapid fire, brrr, you know, like, you are like, Oh, I don't even have to care somewhere in there. There's probably a good shot. Who cares? And you keep going on. Right. Um, and, uh, so I, I agree with you that it does take some of the passion, some of the energy, some of the intensity out of it. But at the same time, it's probably more likely that in the hundred shots that I took, I got the one I wanted. So the outcome may be better, even if the process is maybe a little less, um, passionate. And, and we're on this ride. Everyone's on this ride together because life is speeding up and speeding up. And we have more and more bats. You can go to bat as many times as you want to now uh, in, in my world. When I think of photography, I think about Robert Kappa, who was a uh, wartime photographer uh, in uh, World War II. And he went, I guess it was, uh, maybe it was, the, I think it was the, uh, 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 the beaches at Normandy. He was in the water you know, with his rolls of film and he was making as much as he could, but cause you would, because it's like, you know, this is going down now. So he was, he was doing it. He basically, I, I think the, the way he tells the story um, in the heat of battle, he would often just get exhausted from the fear and the adrenaline. And when that happened, he would take his cameras and stuff and swim back to the boat and pass out. So he swam back to the boat, with, you know, maybe five rolls of film shooting people that are dying next to him. And it was absolutely intense. He went to sleep on the boat or passed out and woke up 
in New York. And he was met with a kid who was, you know, I guess uh, for whatever Life magazine or whatever the, the magazine was, took his, uh, uh, took his film and rushed it in. The kid tried to dry it with a hairdryer, and he ruined most of the film. So, uh, so, so, so the man just, just risked his life, shot all this film. There was one salvageable frame. That salvageable frame is the frame that tells the story of World War II for a lot of people. It's an iconic image. Guys go to war now, and they go out and they, they, they shoot all the shots that they're shooting. There's still only going to be one shot that people actually dig into as their iconic shot. And it just makes me wonder where we're going with that stuff. And I think maybe some of the problems, this is just a musings of a piano player, maybe some of the problems of the future to solve have to do with fitting all of these amazing solutions we've now come up with that have caused the problem of outpacing uh, the human mind, maybe. I don't know. Like that would be an interesting, if I was running like Ben's company, I'd say, make a recording studio that doesn't drive motherfuckers crazy. You know, like I go in and I'm now feel crazy because I've got so many choices, so many options. Um, and my mind is going so quickly on all these things, so much uh, immediate gratification that do you think that the world of software, and maybe not in your realm, but just like in music, uh, in, in the music world, where does your mind go as a creative uh, uh, thinker to solve my problem without being a bummer? Like without saying, I've got an idea, we're just going to make it not go fast anymore. There must be a solution. You know, there's good things and there's bad things about the abundance of creation that goes on now. <laughs> Right. So if you think about the abundance of that, it's like, okay, well, there's, you know, I, I, I don't have one salvageable frame. I've got a thousand. So now the problem becomes, okay, well, which one tells the story? Um, and so the role of, of editing, the role of, dis, of deciding, of discerning that is actually more important than the world where you only had, had one. But the, 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 the bad thing I think that comes about is, you know, a lot of people talk about, it's both good and bad. People talk about, oh, like in the world of the internet, there's no gatekeepers anymore. If you have a great photo or a great song or a great video or a great software, it's like nobody can tell you no because it used to be, oh, you would need to get a record contract or you'd need to get a, a, a TV studio or a film studio. Yeah, the filter, the, the gatekeepers. And if you think about it, the gatekeepers, first of all, held a lot of talented people back because they didn't have the luck or the connections or whatever it took that was not purely creative. There were a lot of people who could have succeeded, but probably didn't because of luck. And then, uh, but the other problem that the gatekeepers provide is it provides bad behavior, right? You have a very hierarchical industry. In fact, I was just reading a story today about how the recording industry is full of bad behavior, which I'm sure is not a surprise. Abysmal, thing. abysmal. Yeah. And it's like any industry where there's like, you know, three kingmakers in the industry and, you know, there's only like, you know, think about the film, like one of my favorite things about the changes that have gone on in the film industry, and by the way, I'm a film major, I at one point in my life thought I was actually going to go into film. And, you know, the film industry used to be, you know, there were something like, you know, 20, 30,000, I don't remember the exact number, screens in the United States. And so in any given week, you could launch like, you know, two, three new movies, because there were only so many physical screens and seats that people could go fill you could only have like two, maybe three new releases a week. And so that pretty much constrained the entire universe of the film industry to making you know, basically 100, 100 to 150 films per year. And in that world, there could only be 100 or 150 directors and 100 and 150 like, you know, leading actors and like producers. And, like, and so people fought viciously and, you know, hazing and bad behavior. And now when you say there's no gatekeepers, you're like, well, guess what? The, that source of power no longer exists. So in the film industry, YouTube or Netflix or the whole streaming revolution means that there's no fundamental limitation on how many things can be made. If it's good, if it deserves to be made and customers want it, then it then it should be made because if it, you know, has, you know, you have no fundamental restriction. There's how many TVs are there in the world now? There's probably a billion, maybe more. That's the fundamental limitation of hours in the day and people who want to watch the stuff. And so that's a good thing and a bad thing. Like the bad thing is we have to filter through and there's a bunch of garbage there. 
And a lot of the ways the tech industry has tried to solve that are actually net negative. You think about the algorithmic feed on social network sites that use attention as the way of deciding what's best. But when you use attention as the decider, actually you get back to lowest common denominator stuff, right? Of like, you know, fear, greed, um, conspiracy theories. And all, like that's what our brains get attached to because it's interesting. It's novel. It grabs our attention. So the bad thing about gatekeepers, like a lot of people said, oh, it's positive. Like citizen journalists are going to be amazing because anybody out there with a camera can tell the story. And we're, gonna, we're not going to have editors anymore. We're not going to have newspapers. And there's no publisher who decides yes or no to a story. We're going to, the truth will finally be out there. And like what we found is very far from that. It turns out, I think that the field of journalism needs gatekeepers, need people who see that as a profession where discerning truth from all the available information actually is a job that needs to be done by someone with that responsibility and who feels the weight of that responsibility. You need the Walter Cronkite who feels the weight of telling the truth so that when he says, hey, this war in Vietnam is immoral, actually the people listen to that because they trust him. And this world without gatekeepers is also a world without trust. And, and, you know, billions of people are not necessarily qualified to discern truth from all the available facts. Like, it's too much. We can't do it. I would say the flip side of that world of no gatekeepers is opportunity. And so when you don't have the same um, limitations of an industry, well, that provides opportunities to more and more people. And that is, of its, in and of itself, is a venerable thing that humanity has always strived for. How do we create more opportunities for more human beings? To fulfill their selves, uh, themselves creatively, to make a living, um, and to do great things with the hours that we have on this planet that are unconstrained now in many ways, where there were substantial constraints before. How many great musicians out there who are now able to actually do that with their life and live their full self that in yesteryear couldn't have done that? And how, you know, and that's the great side of it. Can I get you to uh, write a song with me? I don't, how do I do that? Okay, well, Can here's what we're going to do. If, if you could, because uh, I've all, already asked a lot of your time, and I really appreciate it, but with all my guests, all, all forms of creativity, doesn't matter what you do. In fact, I've had the hardest time with musicians so far. Just take your phone and say a phrase, sing a phrase, grunt, tap, whatever, I'll send you a couple of examples of what I've made, and, and, and which could help you. If it were me, I might just go, da 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 da, da boom boom, and send it. I mean that that could be enough, or it could be uh, the problem's not the problem, the solution's not the problem. The problem is the problem is the solution is the problem. <laughs> you know, you might we might have something that we could turn into some sort so like of a, little like a beat, like something. Yeah, something I can, you can loop. I can loop it. I can make it a melody. I can not use it, but use it as a uh, as uh, as inspiration. I'll send you a couple of examples of that, uh, and then uh, and then you can just make something after you're done. And the next day or two, just text it over to me. I think you've got my number, and uh, if not, I'll make sure you get it. Hey, it's 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 good to see you, and thanks for being uh, 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 thanks for spending so much time with me, beating around all this stuff because I I do feel like what we talked about last time connecting creativity out through the things that you do and not just centering it in, in the arts was part of the inspiration for me doing the podcast. And, uh, and so I, I, I want people that listen to my music to really consider the things that they're doing are probably pretty creative and have the same problems because what's more practical than what you do also what's more creative than what you do. It's both things. And it's a great example for people to see. So, well, I love the idea of creating a podcast around creativity and I can think of no better person to, to do it. So thank you for creating this, Ben. Thanks, man. All right. Take care of yourselves. Whenever I'm talking to a group of developers or whenever we launch a new product here at Twilio for the software developers and the builders and the creators of the world, there's something I always like to say, and it's this. I can't wait to see what you build. I can't wait. I can't wait to see what you build. 
software developers, the builders, creators of the world. I can't wait. I can't wait. Wait. To see what you build. to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot.